Acid Horizon listeners, this is either a good time to subscribe wherever you're listening or perhaps to join us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month where you can gain access to some other content and interact with us during seminars and reading groups that will be happening in 2022. There are many other ways that you can support us. Each one of us has either blogs or musical projects, all of which are linked below. And we also have a merch store as well. Also in the show notes, we often include guests, books, projects, and anything else they might want you to know about. So feel free to take a look there. Okay, let's talk to Jason Reed today about Spinoza, Marx, and the Great Resignation. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today on the show, we are grateful to have with us Jason Reed, whom you might know from his blog, Unemployed Negativity, or books such as The Politics of Trans Individuality. Today on the show, Jason has joined us to address one of the very familiar and always timely questions we often ask. How is it the case that people agitate for their own exploitation? even often thinking that what they're doing enables or entails their liberation. Today, we take up this question with a slightly different but familiar point of focus. How can we understand this broader social phenomenon, often cast in Marxian terms such as alienation, ideology, base superstructure, and so on, through a neo-Spinozist lens? Jason, thank you for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. First things first. I'm not going to assume that everybody who's listening to this knows their Spinoza well or even at all. Maybe what you could do for us is give us a summary picture of Spinoza's politics as it relates to the question that we brought up in the introduction. And also, could you talk about this concept of conatus and how that might relate to the problem that we are approaching today? Yeah, sure. Thank you. The quote that you kind of referenced and often comes up in talking about Spinoza's politics. Today is the famous line from the introduction to the theological political treatise, why do the masses fight for their servitude as if it was salvation, which, as you said, often seems as this kind of precursor to some sort of theory of ideology. Beyond that, and and connecting that to what you said about the Canatus, so Spinoza understood that everything that exists humans included, strives to persevere and maintain its existence. And one of the, you know, kind of important things, not directly politically relevant, but so interesting is that Spinoza didn't think that that in some degrees human beings are that radically unique from everything else in the universe. Right? We tended to see ourselves as a kingdom within a kingdom, as something separate from the way the rest of the universe works. But as far as Spinoza was concerned, we are just a more or less complicated version of everything else, just as everything strives to maintain its existence, we strive to maintain our existence. Now, where this, I think, begins to have some interesting implications politically is that Spinoza didn't think that our striving necessarily had a particular end or telos. It's not like we strive towards the good, um, that our striving was kind of radically undefined, that we all strive to maintain our existence depending on how we've come to understand our existence. Because the other thing that Spinoza says is, I think, important, is he says we are all born conscious of our strivings, but ignorant of the causes of things. Um, We're aware of what we want, but we're not aware of how the world works. And I think I would add to that, and Spinoza sort of adds to that, that one of the things that we're often unaware of is we are unaware of why we strive for what we strive for. We're unaware of the way in which our own striving has been conditioned or shaped by the world around us. In fact, Spinoza thought that we tended to look at this question in the very wrong way. We tend to think that we want something because it's good, rather than realize that something is deemed by us good because we want it. That in some sense, Understanding our striving, we have to look sort of backwards in the history of the relations that have shaped and determined us rather than forwards in terms of or or rather than sort of into the intrinsic qualities of the object or thing. I think really transforms Spinoza's politics because rather than think of politics as being something which sort of deals with the will and wishes of people as a kind of given – Spinoza suggests that the will and wishes of people are constantly being 
shaped and transformed by the institutions and structures around them. And that shaping and transforming is politics. And what of the Conatus? How does this concept play into the politics of Spinoza? The Conatus is our, is our striving. For human beings, it's desire, but desire is just a particular version of the striving that defines everything. Um, part of its particularity is that we are, in some sense, conscious of our desires, whereas the striving of everything else may or may not be conscious. Where is the disconnect then? If we are conscious of it, why can't we be conscious enough to change it on Spinoza's terms? Well, Spinoza makes a distinction that a distinction between what he calls inadequate ideas and adequate ideas. Because Spinoza thinks that ideas are kind of just like everything else in the universe. They are things that are caused and shaped by other things. The difference between adequate and inadequate ideas is that sometimes I am aware of the causes of my ideas and thus I understand them adequately. And sometimes I um, uh, am unaware of the causes of my ideas. Um, and Let's 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 think about the the here, here's a very kind of cheesy kind of example of this to help kind of cash this out. So like let's say if I'm the difference between being aware of the causes of my desires being versus being unaware of the causes of my desires. So let's say for example I you know like I have a particular attachment to say the Star Trek TV series. Cause I used to watch it when I was a kid with my dad. And it was like this very kind of like this, this, like this memory is attached to all this kind of sense of love and comfort. I'm like, I, I like this show, but I'm aware that the causes of my desire are, have less to do with the quality of the supposed show than the, the memories it invokes. So I don't get like involved in like heated online debates about whether or not it's good or how <laughs> people have destroyed it and so on and so forth because I'm aware of the causes of my desires versus someone else who may have the same kind of sort of desire, some kind of love, some kind of passion because they haven't unpacked or examined the conditions of that. They think it has something to do with the object of it. And thus, it's a very unstable thing. I mean, one of the things that Spinoza also talks about, which I think has important political implications is the fundamental ambivalent nature of our affects that as much as Spinoza thinks of affects or emotions as being defined by a particular kind of binaries love and hate um, hope and fear that they're not very stable and they're constantly uh, risk changing over to the other one so love becomes a hate, hope becomes a fear. I mean, some of this is, is clear, like as Spinoza would say, that there's no hope without fear, no fear without hope, right? Everything we want to have happen is attached to the opposite. But the other thing that Spinoza says is, or gets very inter interested in, is the way in which very often the thing that we love is burdened by a kind of anxiety because of the fear that other people might not love it in the same way. I mean, on the one hand, we want other people to love it because Spinoza says the strongest loves, I mean, he says that, that it takes a heart of stone to love what another person leaves aside, right? It takes a kind of strength to, to be all alone in your love. So on the one hand, the social support is a necessary kind of condition, but on the other hand, it also kind of undermines it in the sense that there's always this fear that other people are not going to love it in the right way, or other people are going to somehow contaminate it. Does Spinoza then say, maybe we might raise some doubts about the things that we love because they are so deeply connected to this collective and maybe risk-free or you know, risk-diminished form of love? Does he believe that there's a level of authenticity to our desire then based on the, the kinds of risks that we're willing to take? Hmm. That's a tricky question to think about authenticity in a Spinoza sense. I mean, I do think that Spinoza would make a distinction between, I mean, because 
Spinoza says that, for example, I mean, the basic sort of fundamental orienting aspects of the canatus or striving, or as we've talked about, desire, and the, the two kind of sort of almost elementary uh, affects, which are joy and sadness. Joy simply being defined as an increase of one's capacity to think and act, and sadness is a decrease. From there, we get the sort of the, the next level of sort of complexity. And I do think that, you know, as Spinoza says in, in part three of the ethics, he likes to think of this, the affects for emotional life as kind of like a geometry. And I think it's important to think of it as a geometry, like, because he says, I want to describe it in the same way I describe, would describe anything, lines and bodies and so on. And like a geometry, you start from very simple figures, points, lines, etc., and you try to draw more and more complicated figures. And love is a more complicated figure than joy because it, it involves the idea of an external object, right? And we can be right or wrong about that external object in the sense that we can be, sometimes we think something is the cause of our increase of our power or capacity, and it just happens to be the accidental thing that was there when there was an increase of our capacity and power. It's not an actual cause, it's just a kind of association we have. And the other times we can be actually correct that this thing actually increases our capacity to think and act. And it goes back to this idea of adequate being understanding the causes of things. So I think that that there is uh for Spinoza there are I mean they're they're each equally sort of compelling for us, right? To be wrong and to be attached to something that is actually the cause of not your joy, but may may ultimately in the long term be the cause of your undoing. Like, you know, let's say you go out with friends, you have a really good time, and you think it's because you were drinking so much. And you think, oh my God, I have to really drink so much if I want to have a good time. And you kind of ignore the fact that your friends were there, it was a really good night, you know, you know that some, there are other causes as well. And you decide that you, you need to drink. And that may be the source of both future unhappiness, because you go out and drink and it's not as much fun, and long-term undermining of your existence because... You know, you start drinking too much alcohol and that has its own psychic and physical effects and so on. So uh, adequacy, I guess, more than than authentic, authenticity. Um, Will, you had a question. Yeah. Uh, so, so part of this discussion about like adequate apprehension of the thing, I think, is really helpful, particularly when it comes to uh, your piece on order and connection. There's a passage I really like which is on the the quotidian criticism of work or of capitalism in general that that favors a discussion about the evils of the big corporation, why your boss is an ass or um and what it fails to comprehend is the broader perception of these common relations in their totality or like the plurality. And in a certain sense the way in which you pull in these sort of myopic debates about a television show that one might have loved because their father their father watched it versus the other one who can't have Perseus's cap pulled off this reversal of of the wool cap pulled off is there a certain way in which once and certainly um you know, following the lines of of Spinoza, this will will happen in in sort of the Spinozism of the of the nineteen sixties and seventies. Is there is there an element of um, this idea of understanding the order of nature that allows us to sort of find the limits of our critique? Right, if we are simply just very upset that you know this user on Twitter insulted this episode of a television show that I liked, but I can't sort of psychoanalytically find why it might be in the name of the father that I that I defend uh, the great the great work in finding this ambivalence and finding the way in which our striving is tending us towards these particular intensities when we complain about something rather than the broader system is is it through Spinoza you think that the the Marxian critique can sort of find its own limits yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think one of the things that is useful for Spinoza is that he doesn't think that on a certain level where we can't really ever overcome – 
the fact that we are finite beings and as finite beings, we are affected by the world around us and that sometimes are, there's a certain sense in which the, our knowledge of things and the way things feel can be at odds, right? Um, and I mean, Spinoza says this, you know, in 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 Proposition Thirty Seven, Part Four, the Ethics, where he talks about the idea that the the state or the the political sort of body politic is, on the one hand, is a rational thing, because Spinoza says nothing is more useful to human beings than human beings living collectively. It's a lot better than living like out in nature on your own, um, and there's a rational dimension to it, but there's also an affective dimension to it. We want other people to love what we love. We want to be acknowledged. And and those two things are both there and they're both unavoidable. They're both part of what it means to be human. So taking this to, to what you're saying in your question about sort of thinking about capitalism through the sort of same way. I mean, for me personally, I find this useful in the sense that um, on the one hand, I understand like through looking at this sort of thinking about capitalism structurally that, you know, even at the level of a, of a, an employee at a state university, there's this push to extract more and more work from me to, to, um, to, you know, uh, uh, you know, having to spend more and more time working on classes, working on sort of committee type work, filling in, responding to emails, et cetera. And so I understand it as a, as a, a hostile alien f- force or you know something's being done to me but on the other hand i still have this sort of affective attachment to the idea of being like a team player and a, a responsive professor who responds to people's emails and isn't like blowing people off so like my, my affective sensibility is is like kind of keeping me like doing all this typing away at my computer keep me here hours upon hours where my intellectual understanding is Hey, wait, you know, slow down. This is like, this is exactly what they want you to think. So like, there's a certain sense in which I think Spinoza makes it possible to understand how we sometimes, you know, going back to the idea of fighting for our servitudes if it was salvation, that sometimes at an effective emotional level, we deal with things differently than on an intellectual, um, conceptual level. And that, um, and the struggle is to kind of reconcile those two sides of what it means to be to be to be a human being. Yeah, it, it seems that w- what is essential here too is the perpetual the necessity to recognize participation in processes of subjectivation, but more importantly, subjection. Like the, the that the your participation in processes of being subject to a particular like power relation is Mm -hmm. sort of essential yeah and i think that that one of the i think one of the interesting things you know one of the interesting people in person i talked about the paper uh frederick lordon i think has made an interesting kind of contribution to this this discussion around spinoza because i think frederick lordon has picked up on this idea that there's a certain tendency to i mean spinoza argues a tendency to affirm and find a kind of joy, even in any situation, right? To always extract from it what, and I think um, other philosophers have talked about this, this sort of tendency towards joy, but like the difference between the way Lordon talks about it and the way that someone like Deleuze might talk about it, Deleuze really finds that as an affirmation. Lordon thinks that might actually be the thing that keeps us tied to that which is like finding a bit of joy and agency in any situation may actually keep us tied to that situation in the sense that, you know, I mean, I, I, I think about this with, with, in terms of work, everyone thrown in any work situation, you're always able to find those tiny bits of joy that are possible in the situation, right? Like, oh yeah, I get to work with this guy or this person. They're pretty cool. That's all right. Or, you know, on these days we get to do this, you know, they can be, they can become, you know, tiny, tiny infinitesimal, but they become the basis of our attachment. You know, as you're pointing out, part of that attachment in your, in your previous question, part of that attachment is the inability to see beyond the specific situation, 
right? I mean, like in some sense, people complain about work all the time and are aware of the subjection internal to work, but it's often framed not in terms of the general structural subjection that you have to sell your labor power in order to survive, but it's framed in terms of this job, this boss, the particular subjection, which always carries with it the corollary, the fantasy that there's going to be another job, another boss that is going to be better. Um, And so the combination of the extracting a tiny joy in in the most disempowering situation with this tendency to focus on the specifics of the situation rather than the structural conditions is in some sense the way in which I think subjectivity and subjection get thoroughly intertwined in a specific situation. So it's hard to pull them apart. You know, it reminds me, especially in my youth, working either part-time jobs or part-time jobs that have full-time hours. You go to work and of course you're miserable, but then while at work, you're imagining this giant cinnamon sticky bun in the vending machine. And that's the thing that just makes it all that you're able to digest everything else that was pushed down your throat that day. And it also makes me think too of the kind of Stockholm syndrome with which we feel like when we quit that job and, you know, maybe in the ensuing hours, days or weeks, we feel a little bit of remorse then, you know, after some time we find something better and it's like, okay, actually that, that situation was pretty shit. Of course, then you get involved in something else and you start the cycle all over again. So yeah, that's fascinating. In this chapter we've been reading, uh, you discuss two of the most, I guess, most prominent contemporary writers trying to perhaps bring together Spinoza and Marx to provide a new understanding of sort of contemporary capitalism and so on. But, um, the background to this, I guess, is also that there's a, an interesting, sort of history to that as well. And I have read your your review of Machery's Hegel or Spinoza. But for those who who haven't or haven't read Machery's book, I was wondering if you might be able to say something about why both he and sort of prominently Althusser, what was it that they, they sort of saw in Spinoza? Why 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 turn to him during during those years, which has obviously now fed into new writers, particularly French writers who continue to have that same interest? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. I mean, I, I think one of the things, I mean, to, to, to start with Althusser a little bit and, and start with the work that Althusser did with, you know, Machere and, and others with, on reading Capital, when, he, when Spinoza gets invoked there, it is in this idea that, that there are, well, three different models of thinking causality. Um, that causality can be understood as sort of a linear causality or efficient causality, you know, billiard ball hits the billiard ball and, and moves on. That's one model of thinking causality. Another model of thinking causality is what Althusser calls expressive causality in this notion that he attributes to sort of to Hegel or to sort of an idea that, you know, the whole is always in the part. I mean, I think that the, the best model of expressive causality and sort of in thinking in Marxist terms is when, you know, Lukash opens his famous essay on reification of the conscious proletariat and says, there's nothing in capitalism that cannot be solved in the commodity form. The commodity is kind of like the riddle of which everything, everything stems to understanding the commodity, right? It's this idea that, that the entire whole is in, is in, is in the part. So for Althusser, both of those are kind of inadequate for understanding the complexity and determination of capitalism. Capitalism can't be understood as a simple linear causality, like the base just simply acts on the superstructure that material relations simply cause ideas, nor does he really want to frame it in terms of an expressive causality, even though for a lot of Marxists like Lukács, that seemed more adequate because Althusser thinks that capitalism is not just a kind of expressive whole, there are ways in which there are remnants of pre-capitalist sort of relations internal to it and, poss- and other possibilities that, that the, the, you can't just understand this expressive relation to part and whole. So what does Spinoza make possible? This idea of imminent causality, that the cause exists only in and through its effects. And I think one of the things that this does for thinking about capitalism, thinking about Marx, is that it totally, in some sense, you know, if we have the famous sort of topography or edifice of the base, the economic relations and the superstructure, the ideolo- ideological relations on top of that, that imminent causality is a way of understanding the fact that 
on the one hand, yes, the base, the economic relations produce the superstructure. But on the other hand, the superstructure, especially ideology, which keeps people showing up to work each day and so on, is a necessary condition of the reproduction of the base, right? That the that there is nothing, there is nothing which is just an effect. Every effect has to simultaneously be thought of as a cause. Now, I think with that. You know the the the, the Machere sort of response gets gets to be a little more complicated, but I think that that uh, I think that for Machere the other important notion from Spinoza is trying to think of history and social relations without a positing a kind of progression or telos or endpoint. And that Spinoza makes possible a way of thinking. I mean, I think there's because for Spinoza, this is what we're talking about in terms of desire, that like that, that which I I I strive for is actually an effect rather than a cause. It's an effect of the way in which my desires have been shaped. In the same way, all endpoints have to be understood as um, really being some sense the products of and the mystifications of the causal conditions that have that have produced them. That's interesting. It's, it sort of sounds. I, mean, I think we've talked before on Twitter probably about just the idea of ideology and, and how we, how we should understand it, particularly because Deleuze, for Deleuze and Guattari, who are in many senses sort of Spinozist, you know, they they say openly there is no such thing as ideology, and there never has been. Um, there is only desire, and there's sort of the, the affirmation of what it is that we. Would, well, in a certain way, the desire to act through us and, you know, we affirm that. On the one hand, I guess I want to ask, do you think there's something in Spinoza which can help us understand it in a in a way that's less deterministic than the base superstructure sort of relation? Do you think there's something in Spinoza which can help us do that in terms of thinking about sort of these sort of, sort of sets of complex causes, but also the reasons why we don't always see what's really going on, um, you know, causing that, you know? Is, that, is there something there in Spinoza? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that, I mean, throughout the sort of, and as you said, by by now, a long history of sort of Marxist Spinozism that that even as recent invocation, I mean, we, we can go back to we can go back to Soviet examples too, but even in the recent invocation that starts with, you know, sort of Althusser and, and and so on, it's you know, it, it's it's over 50 years old. There's been varying responses to the re, to the relationship between this way of thinking Spinoza and Marx together and the question of ideology. For someone like Althusser, Spinoza was a theorist of ideology. Right? Spinoza says very clearly that there are these different levels of knowledge. There's this sort of, uh, the first level of knowledge, which is inadequate knowledge. That's where we dwell, where we spend most of our time. You know, we are in ideology most of the time. This other form of knowledge, recognizing the common notions and relations that structure things is a very difficult, we can only ever kind of partially be in it, right? And that's what, you know, uh, we understand as science. I think other uh, Spinozas have have rejected that kind of rigid distinction and argued that to some extent ideologies, I think, remains too intellectual or theoretical of a concept because it posits truth and falsity as the primary points of distinction and that um, and that doesn't get at the way in which our attachment and relation to different ideas are lived. But I think another important point in some of the recent figures that it's worth pointing out in terms of ideology is this sort of debate of sort, I would think, between uh, Frederick Lordon and Yves Citon in the sense that Lordon would argue that capitalism doesn't really need ideology to reproduce itself, right? As soon as it institutes itself to the point where in order for me to get what I want, I need to sell my labor power, and that no longer seems strange to me, it no longer seems as an imposition outside of me. It seems, I mean, take the phrase working for a living, right? Which presents in a kind of immediacy what is actually a thoroughly mediated relationship, right? Because I go to work, I sell my labor power, I get money that allows me to buy goods and services, produce my life. It kind of collapses all of that as if when I go out to work, I'm, I'm actively reproducing my existence. I could be doing something that's actually pointless to my existence or even actively hostile to my existence in the sense that I'm working for some company that has nothing to do with my own survival or well-being, but it gets collapsed. But that collapse is a real effect of 
the structural conditions which convert my striving to persevere my being into a striving to sell my labor power. I think Verdun would say that's not ideological at all. It doesn't need a sort of conception or idea, a justification. It's just, it's almost like a habit built into our very striving, um, produced by the destruction of alternatives and by the way in which our striving is sort of educated in this way. Whereas I think uh, uh, Citon would point to the fact that that, even that striving doesn't take place without its kind of mystification at the same time. Um, or another way to think about this is I think about the strange ambiguity in the often repeated phrase or question, you know, which is weirdly instrumental to our social life, where people will ask someone almost immediately upon meeting them, what do you do for a living? And I, I find this question to have two levels to it. Because on the one hand, it's a question of where do you stand in the social order? What kind of power do you have? How are you determined and shaped? But it's also usually used as a, a question to ask, who are you and what do you want to be? So that includes both a kind of immediate bodily existence. You know, how do you reproduce yourself? What kind of power? Where are you in our social hierarchy? But also, who do you think you are? And I think that the, the way in which work is combined is both a necessary condition of our survival and a realization of our will and desire shows the way in which we are simultaneously in terms of in terms of ideology on one side of a, sort of a sub ideological level of about the construction and, and shaping of our striving and desires that is almost sort of pre ideological. I think that's what a lot what Deleuze and Guattari are getting at, like there's only the desire and social and nothing else. And then this other sort of more mythic aspect that is ideological, but the two things kind of, they kind of coexist, but they also kind of threaten to come apart in sometimes. Frederick Ledon is a little bit optimistic about this because he, he thinks that, that to some extent, contemporary capitalism has sort of has sort of made a deal with the devil of a sort in telling us that we should all find in work the realization of our passion and who we are. Because on the one hand, of course, this makes us the best possible employees, right? Because um, we are showing up and we're not supposed to show up or work and we're not supposed to work. But on the other hand, you know, I think this is where Lord Don almost gets kind of oddly prophetic there's a day coming where people are going to realize, oh my God, work has nothing to do. Like, I can't find my desires here. And when that day comes, I think Lordon thinks the kind of anger and frustration, indignation that will come with that is going to be sort of massive. I would like to believe in that, but I find it Sometimes hard to see that. Although, I mean, there is this question of, of I think, a good question of, and, and I haven't yet made sense of it, which is why, you know, what we're living through right now, the so-called great resignation and the extent to which people have been, you know, quitting their jobs, at least in the U.S. I'm not sure how much it correlates across Europe, you know, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, how much this stems from maybe an indignation, a frustration to recognize that work doesn't exist to realize your passions, or maybe how much it may come from other more fundamental things that, you know, the thing you do for a living, especially during the COVID pandemic, has been shown to be something that's quite comfortable with killing you, and openly so in terms of exposing people to to immense amount of risk. Yeah, I mean, this is one of my favourite parts of the um, Order and Connection essay was its discussion of money. And I think the Great Resignation is a, is an effect of the event, essentially the secondary characteristic of money as a control mechanism falling short. Because you describe in the essay, you know, it's typically either used to inspire hope or to put off fear. I mean, previously, at least in places with more welfareist models, you had this social sort of um, grounding, you had the social safety net at a baseline, and money was to buy you off so that you could kind of hope for this, because otherwise you might hope for something else, like whatever those, whatever those people were doing on the other side of Berlin. 
kind of thing. But now it's fully essentially during COVID, they've had to introduce some sort of welfare as basis so that the economy doesn't collapse. And then essentially it removes the old possibilities of hope aren't coming back. No. But the idea of constantly deferring fear has itself been destroyed, or partially at least. And that's why I think you see this. I think we are sort of in this sort of moment right now of people thinking, oh shit, my striving going to be satisfied by this anymore. And I was only striving in this direction. I was only giving it certain kinds of emotional weight because I do couldn't see anything else was possible. But it's it's all the imminent I was about to say expression, but imminent expression is contradicting the theories of causality we have here. And I think it seems like your way you describe money in this piece is particularly uh, prescient in terms of it is actually an effective control mechanism even before it's an exchange mechanism. The next time that I go to a party, my opener is going to be, who do you think you are? I don't want to be that guy, but Jason, you wanted to respond to that. I would actually like to hear your response to Adam's point. Yeah, I, I think that, that yeah, um, raises a good question. I mean, one of the one of the things that that, going back to this sort of great resignation, you know, of course, the question comes up, if people are not working, how are they surviving? And I think one of the responses which has come up is has been to point out that how inadequate wages were to people's survival even before this, that people were dependent upon either sort of informal networks of social support, meaning that, you know, you couldn't afford rent, so you had to live with multiple other people, or you, you know, still had to live at home with your parents or something else to supplement their wages. Or, and this is the part that I think is speculative, but it's interesting, and, and I would love to see some research on this. Some have suggested that given that so many employers in the U.S. inform people because they pay poverty wages about the possibilities of applying for things food stamps or other forms of economic assistance, that since people were already supplementing their meager wages with other forms of assistance, that really the connection between, so, so you know, work, I mean, money, as, you, as, as we were talking about, money on the one hand is, a, is the face of pure survival, right? You need money to survive, but money is also supposedly the face of, of desire. You need money in order to get these things you might want. But when you have people who are – they're cut off from the, con- the sort of consumerist sort of way of organizing their desire because they don't really make enough money to think about buying all sorts of nice things. That's not what drives them coming to work. But they're also cut off from maybe even the survival aspect of, of money because money – their wages are not enough to reproduce even their conditions of existence, then you lose the sort of affective weight that attaches people to earning a wage. So, you know, maybe, and this is you know, understanding the great resignation, it just took a little more of a tipping point for people to say, all right, that's it. I'm out. I wasn't making enough money to get these things you supposedly tell me that I should want. And I wasn't making enough money to even reproduce my existence. So I don't see the point of this anymore. Jason, I was curious if as a professor, and we might be going off the track here a little bit, and so if you don't want to answer this question, by all means, please reject it. But you as a professor have um, an access to a certain kind of knowledge, what I would call the statistical reality of the way that students have responded to the COVID epidemic. And so in view of you know this this whole idea that the pandemic has reshaped or, you know, stands to reshape further our desire. What has been maybe an important difference that you notice with respect to students, their perceptions of school, their future, and so forth? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, uh, I definitely think that that one of the things that students have picked up on, because I teach a class on, on work every spring, is they've picked up on, especially last year, the increased hostility shown towards employees, especially as, I mean, I think part of what happened, partly what, what, what kind of interrupted a certain um, hierarchy in work is that, you know, when, when employees at restaurants and other service type jobs were suddenly given the responsibility of enforcing, say, masking mandates or other forms of COVID precautions, I think one of the things that they sort of crashed right into is the fact that people, some people, not all people, but 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 a large number of people 
um, when they go into a store or a restaurant, the last thing they want to hear is some someone telling them what to do. That to some extent, the partly why they go there is is I mean, part of the, the sort of affective economy of a consumer society is you you know even if you don't have a ton of money. Anyone can go in and sort of yell at someone and be expected to be catered to as a consumer, right? The whole consumer is always right sort of notion. And when people are put in the position of sort of contesting that or at least pointing out that there are human beings uh, working on the other side of the counter or in this restaurant, people react to it with a great deal of anger and hostility, so I think that has kind of – that along with the being exposed to risk has kind of undermined a certain way of thinking about work, a certain like ideology in the sense that you know I think people are told and people on the one hand believe that all work – if you if you work for a wage, you're you're making a meaningful contribution, and on some level, you know you can sort of you can sort of stand tall and be seen as making a contribution. But the 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 flip side of that is that not only is not all work considered equal, but some work has that inequality fundamentally built into it in the sense that part of what you are doing is. Uh, giving people a place to be able to tell someone what to do. Part of the attachment, you know, the sort of crisis that happened in the U.S. about people couldn't go out to eat is that going out to eat is not, you know, not just because you can get better food and you can get it home, but it's also because you get to kind of sort of lord over this tiny fiefdom for an hour or so where people can cater to you. And that's part of what people um, get out of a service consumer-based society. Yeah. I can remember being a young student and getting that tract, Abolish Restaurants. Maybe you remember this one. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I remember at the time thinking, you know what, I'm 18, 21 years old. I'm like, no way. But nowadays I could see more people being on board with this idea. Well, when it comes to that sort of change in attitudes, I mean, a certain kind of analysis in terms of ideology can can be seen by certain sort of materialist factions of, uh, sort of as being a bit too focused on the ideas. But what what I really like about the the Spinozist reading is that through certain works, this has now become not so much an event of the ideas, but a neurological event. Um, sort of critique of ideology is a neurological event. COVID is a neurological event, and I think one of the best people to look into this for this kind of uh, neurological reading of Spinoza, you get people like Antonio Damasio. And his theory that essentially when, when we do reasoning, uh, the factors that we're reasoning with, the certain events, places, goals, values, they all have certain weight to them based on our effective composition. There are effective or somatic markers in the brain which weigh certain things down in terms of our moral reasoning. It's almost like an investment. And in that sense, if you can start to understand the brain in that sort of Spinoza sense along with Damasio as well as people like Catherine Malibu, you can then start to consider ideology, not in terms of a structure of ideas of the church, but a channel of producing and shaping affect such that it will strive in certain ways because it gives certain weight to certain things over others. If people no longer give weight as, not, as, not, as much weight to money or even to survival in the sense that they used to, that means that there is a sort of neurological event happening here. COVID has kind of been a kind of trauma that has uh, elaborated the plasticity of our own brains. And in that sense, the causality of the brain in relation to the body and to the wider world and the symbolic and the material is that they're actually coextensive. So this is what I, what I really liked about this paper in mind, this, this, this coextensive nature. And in, in that sense, it, I, I, what, what do you think this means, Jason, in terms of the, the sort of contender that is Spinozism for the new frontier of materialism, this neurological, biological dimension. And has that been particularly exposited in literature? Yeah, I think I think that's definitely a very interesting way of thinking about it in the sense that, you know, um, you could understand, say, for example, a kind of life spent of, you know, working five days a week and, you know, getting your weekends off and, and having enough money to cover your 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 expenses, but also have enough money to aspire to certain, you know, desired objects as being a training of 
of the body, a training of the mind, a sort of habituation in particular, a sort of affective economy. And when that affective economy is interrupted, as I think it was for many during COVID, interrupted in terms of either people were not going into work um, or uh, working in very different ways or, uh, or, or I should say, and um, consumption sort of lost some of its its effective appeal because you go into a store now and it's it's are you uh, you have anxiety about sort of contamination and you're wearing masks and everything is there to remind you so so there's a kind of breakdown of both the pains and the pleasures and the way those pains and pleasures kind of fit together to sort of structure a particular kind of striving so i think that's that's one thing um but i do think that we shouldn't confuse the interruption of a particular kind of habit as the transformation of that habit. Because I do think for there are many people who, who welcome this interruption and begin to reorient themselves. Uh, there are other people for whom there was nothing but the desperate desire to reinstitute that habit at any costs. But I also think that the more important point is that it's not enough to simply disrupt a habit, but it has to be talk about a political transformation. There would have to be the constitution of new habits and new ways of living and new ways of orienting oneself the, on a both an individual and a collective level. And I do think that there that seems to be something that is the so-called great resignation is still a very disparate and disconnected. I mean, it's it's. It's it's very much people experiencing a collective social condition individually. And maybe maybe not entirely. I mean, I think it may be worth pointing out that people are like aware on some level, like because these things circulate. People hear about like you know you, you go to a, a store and you see a sign like sorry we had to close, everyone left, and people like even those and that then the, that gets photographed becomes a meme or whatever you know even there is some level of of collectivity and communication but it does seem to be primarily an isolated you know a phenomenon of 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 millions of people independently removing themselves from this this association rather than collectively transforming this association and i do think that for it to become something else, there needs to be not just a, a sort of negation, but an affirmation of something else, right? Of another way of living. And I think that's the tricky thing, and I think that one of the things that, that Spinoza really articulates is the sense that there's a particular bind when it comes to transformation in that how we live shapes how we imagine and think and limits and curtails our possibility to to imagine and think. But at the same time, we can't live differently unless we can imagine and think differently. So moments like the, the moment that we've gone through with COVID become a, a at best the point of a wedge, right? They drive a they disarticulate and disconnect what has been tied together, work consumption tied together as two sides of uh, a kind of uh economy of affect, they begin to disconnect them. But disconnecting them is not the same. And this is the other, I think, important emphasis of, of Spinoza. That you can't just predicate a politics on a negation of something. A politics has to be the affirmation of something as well. I wanted to ask about this idea of, sort of imagination, because um, we've talked already a bit about uh, Lord Don, um, who is the first part of your uh, essay here. Uh, we haven't said so much yet about uh, the other author, the recent author that you discuss in this, this chapter, which is uh, Yves Citon. He, he seems to emphasize the importance of narrative and myth as the ways in which power is represented and how we think about our relation to, to that political power. And that for Spinoza, our capacity for imagination is, is the limit of our uh, power to act. We can't do what we can't imagine, I think you put it. Um, we have to first be able to imagine something in order to be able to go out and do it. And it may be we don't do it, we actually can't do what we imagine and so on. But that's sort of the necessary condition. And so it matters that we do think about sort of narrative and myth, presumably, for, for Satan. And in that sort, of, that sort of train of thought, I wanted to sort of put a, uh, a passage that you wrote from this chapter and just sort of hope you could sort of say a little about it. So I thought it was really interesting. You write that uh, the economic imaginary has its extremes, not worker and capitalist, but independent individual 
or the entrepreneur who creates opportunities and new conditions, an individual who fails to work hard or take risks and becomes dependent. It thus functions as an allegory of the extremes of autonomy and dependence. Is that sort of what you think is the sort of overriding sort of myth or, or narrative that we, we are sort of told and which we perhaps engage in and reproduce? And what does it mean for, for politics right now? Yeah, as far as right now, I mean, I mean, I think that it's it's worth pointing out that that one of the other things that happened since we've been talking so much about COVID and the transformation around that is, in some sense, it it forced us to recognize dependency in the midst of supposed independence because i mean we usually i mean we don't usually think of the ways in which we are dependent upon things like global supply chains about you know the series of relations that that sort of make possible our consumption and even our, our work that these things remain sort of out of out of sight and out of mind i mean this is sort of where a kind of spinoza's analysis kind of correlates with a sort of marxist Fetishism of commodities, right? That that we when we look at the commodity, we just we just see it in terms of its value. We don't see the conditions of its existence. But to a certain extent, the COVID pandemic forced us to confront our own dependency. And I think this going back to what we were talking about earlier. I think this is partly what explains some of the the strange hostility around it because people don't like being reminded of their own dependency because they see their own dependency as impotence, as a lack of power as being depended upon, right, rather than, and I think this is where, you know, the, the constitution of, you know, maybe new myths are necessary. We have to, we have to rethink dependency or our interrelatedness, not just as a passive dependency, but as the conditions for a different kind of activity or agency. Um, and I think that, a kind of breaking of the two figures of the capitalist myth of the sort of entrepreneur who's dependent upon no one creates their own conditions and the despised dependent person to think the way in which we are all not only dependent upon each other, but because we are dependent upon each other's others, we are capable of acting in different ways. You know, and this goes back to like the, the other point we're saying, like, what would happen if if the Great Resignation became not an individual act, but a collective act, and what would that look like? And I think to some extent, you know, the mythic work is being done. I mean, the circulation of these, you know, we quit sort of signs from like a dollar store or another fast food place is itself on a on a tiny level a creation of a new of a new myth. Um, uh, in the sense of a new sensibility, a new imagination that you can walk off the, the job and see what happens, which is not something that had the same visibility it had prior to all this. Well, Jason, before we wrap up here today, I, I'd like to hear more about what you're writing now and what are some things that we can expect from you in the future in terms of books or other kinds of publications. Yeah, well, I have... A- Weirdly, embarrassingly, I have uh, two books kind of coming out. One, a collection of essays called The Production of Subjectivity, Marx and Philosophy. And the other, um, which to some extent, this some of this conversation has already touched on a lot, is a book coming, will, will be coming out from Verso. I, I don't know when. I just found out that they, they liked my the recent draft I submitted to them was considered now the final draft. So we're, we're there now uh, called the double shift, the politics and economics of work, which is to some extent. And sometimes I think about calling it the double shift Marx and Spinoza on the politics and economics of work, because it is, I, I decided with this book to, to rather than write, I thought about writing a kind of like, here's why Marx and Spinoza go together. Well, kind of generic book, but I thought it'd be more useful to write this actively like it'd be more useful to kind of rather than say these two philosophical perspectives go together well, generically, to actually think about the place where they go together very well, which is around our attachment to work and the way work shapes us and shapes our imagination, and our political possibilities, rather than sort of say, because people have done this, there are lots of different attempts to think Spinoza and Marx together, to think Marx and Spinoza together in a specific set of problems, rather than sort of just abstractly. And that's what the, the double shift book does. So in some sense, the double is also Spinoza and Marx thought thought together. So that's coming at some point, hopefully in the next year from 
from Verso. I haven't heard back on what our schedule is. Well, that's excellent because we kind of got a double today. We got not only Spinoza and Marx, but we got the Great Resignation. We got COVID. We got a lot in here. And I'm very happy with the way that this episode went because I think we got a sense, too, of the way that we can apply philosophy. I mean, we're, we're really close to these problems, and that's exciting to me as, as a philosopher and, and a podcaster. Thanks for having me. This has been great.